platform and some flowers and things built across here and we're going to re-carpet up here and <clears throat> I believe it's going to look a lot better when we get finished. Today is what day? This is bound to be uh, the 21st, right, of August 1988. In that book that we were studying a little bit last week, the man made a statement that's a very common fallacy of people that write books on Revelation that he makes uh, the same mistake a lot of them have made. And, uh, and that's this, Revelation 13, and I want to cover this and answer a couple of questions. Let's just start in verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, Here's the verse we want to get to. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, in this book I was preaching about last week where this man has predicted the rapture to happen in September. He made this statement that the, I believe he said it like this, that the Antichrist would be killed. And that the devil would raise him from the dead. Now I want to tell you that that is impossible. The Bible tells me that God alone is the creator. The devil cannot create life. The devil cannot give life. He's a bringer of death. And so that's not what that verse is talking about. That one verse there could prove the whole book to be wrong that we were studying last Sunday. Not talking about that at all. Remember this, all healing even comes from God. Doctors can't heal you. Uh, the devil don't heal you. If you. I don't care if the man that did the praying was a devil. If you got healed, it was God that did the healing. The devil cannot heal and the devil cannot bring life and the devil cannot create. So, what this is referring to here is this. We've studied it before, but we'll cover it again for a moment. This is talking about the Catholic Church and the popes and so forth. Now what happened, remember when we studied, and, and by the way, starting, let me throw this in. I, I make a lot of statements about the Roman Catholic Church. And some of you don't know anything about the Roman Catholic Church. Next week, I'm going to begin something in this church, the Lord willing. I'm going to take about the first five minutes of my sermon, and I'm going to teach on a particular doctrine of the Catholic Church. I'm going to tell you what they believe. And we may take eight or 10, 12, 15 weeks, just throw in about five minutes before we preach. Uh, the Bible does a lot of teaching about the Catholics, but it also talks about the Protestants. Amen. So we're going to show you why we talk about them so much. And I'm not against people. I'll never forget being down in Greenville a year or so ago when I preached in that Catholic church or school or whatever it was. The little lady who was a Catholic was so thoughtful to bring me a big jug of ice water. Now that may sound like a simple little thing for you, but I've preached in Baptist churches and Pentecostal churches and 99% of them wouldn't bring you nothing. Hello? But she was so thoughtful, just in little simple things that, yeah, if there's anything she could, and I appreciated that, so I'm not against people. If you're a Baptist, I'm not against you. If you're a Methodist or a AME, Zion, or this or that or that. I'm not against you, but it's the system of denominations that I preach against, not the people in there. I want you to understand that. Many people are in something, and, and uh, they don't even know they're in anything. It kind of reminds me of these women sometimes that fall in love with some man. And he's a sorry old character. And they get in there and they get like a fish. 
You know, a man go out here, go fishing, he'll throw a line in the water, and in a little bit, to, that fish will bite, and he'll set that hook, and he get that hook in that jaw of that fish, and it couldn't get loose because there's a barb there, and it just hold him, and, and some of you women fall in love with a sorry old man, and he got you hooked in the jaw, and you can't get loose, or you think you can't. Hello? About like somebody the other day was going on with this fellow, and he was causing all these problems and running around and this and that and the other, and she was living with him and wasn't even married to him. And somebody gave her some advice that you ought to leave him and shake him up. Well, if I did, I'm afraid he wouldn't have me back. She didn't want to go nowhere to start with. So somehow he's hooked her in the jaw real good with his fish hook and she can't get loose. She thinks she can't. People listen to these old love songs. I can't stop loving you. I'm so lonesome I could cry. I can't stop loving you. I could stop loving you if I wanted to, but I just don't choose to right now. Hello? Don't hang up. All this, well, I love him and I can't help it. No, you just all hooked in the jaw and too close to the forest to see the trees. and You quit loving him if you wanted to. I seen one woman carrying on like that one time. He won't never be nobody but him for me and all this. And then so finally, them two got all broke up and they had the worst cat fighting in the divorce court and alimony and carrying on that you've ever heard of and i thought boy she's singing a different song now she thought she couldn't live without him at one point hey amen i don't know how i got into that but that done somebody good today but anyway let's go back in history the first church that was established upon the day of pentecost it was not a denomination but the Spirit fell on about 3,000 people that day. First it was 120 in the upper room, and then they staggered out and Peter began to preach, and 3,000 was added to the church. Now they had churches in various cities. Like in the Bible, they say under the church at Ephesus. Here we'd say under the church in Rocky Mount. That's where we're at. So they, they just had a church in each city. But finally, after a number of years, they begin to form an organization. And here is the sad thing. Listen to this. That church finally became the Catholic Church. It just got further and further from God. And it became the Catholic Church. And they set up a pope. Now watch this. The pope was the head of the religion. But he also became the head of the politics. This is history. This is what the children would study in school. There was an hour when the Pope was the head of religion and the head of politics. Now somebody said, what's that mean? Well, let me give you an example. If we elected Jerry Falwell to be the President of the United States today, then he also is the head of his big Baptist thing and all of this. What would he do? Ain't no doubt that he would put all of us Pentecostals, and, and I use that term, not that I'm Pentecostal, but I mean, we pray for the sick and that type of thing. He would probably put all the Pentecostals out of business. He would have the law behind him and the authority of the president that if anybody disagreed with his religion, he'd just throw you in jail or something. Now, if you think that's not coming in this country, it's coming faster than you can imagine. They've got investigations going down on preachers now. And uh, all kinds of things. They'll probably bring all kinds of power through the internal revenue. And they've just closed down anything they disagree with. And if you think that the government of this country, if you think there's freedom, we don't have near the freedom that you think we have. I remember a number of years ago when Brother Suggs was working for me. He... Uh, he may not have been working at that time, but anyway, he called me one day and he said, uh, I've got a brother that works at a radio station in Farmville and said, some government agents have been over there asking questions about you. 
Well, they didn't know I knew that. I said, well, I ain't doing nothing wrong, so. About six months went by. I don't know what kind of an investigation they had going. But one day, here they come. Two of them, throwing out their badges. You have the right to remain silent. You, you know, just like the police. I said, what do you do? Come to arrest me? Oh, uh, no, we just come to talk to you. You got the right to not say anything. Get a lawyer. I said, sound like you're arresting me to me. What have I done? Nothing. We just want to talk. Well, what it was, it was some people with the post office. And so they, what, what really boiled down to, they were upset that I was telling that God healed the sick. And I'm talking men that were paid their salary with tax money. They themselves did not believe that God healed the sick. And they questioned me like I was a criminal for an hour. And they told me, said, when they started, said, we don't want to hear nothing about no Bible now. Well, what kind of authority do I have other than a Bible authority? They didn't like dreams, they didn't like visions, and they did not like healing. And, uh, <clears throat> boy, I mean, they just put me through the fifth degree for a long time. So I finally got irritated at them. I thought I've answered about as much as I'm going to answer. And I finally looked at him and I said, listen here. I said, if you really want to know if this thing's real, if you want to know if I've ever had a spiritual dream or a vision, if you really want to know, I said, and I can't give you this answer, but I can tell you where to go to get it. I said, I'll just give you one example and there's thousands of them out here. I said, you get a hold of Mr. Tyson in... Norfolk, Virginia, we call him Deacon Tyson. Burnell, I think was his name. He's dead now. I gave him his address. I said, you contact him. I said, there's a woman. I don't know her name, but I said, he brought her to one of my meetings in Portsmouth, Virginia. I'd never seen her. And I said, uh, they brought a prayer line of people for me to lay hands on across there. And I said, this woman came before me and I didn't know her, but the Spirit began to show me something in the, the vision. And I said, I saw that she had a cancer. And I began to tell her about it. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. And I said, within 72 hours, you're going to get sick. You feel like you're going to throw up. And I began to tell her how that feeling would come in her stomach, that hot, watery feeling in her mouth, and all that was going to happen. And I said, the devil will tell you in that hour that you're going to die. But I said, it's a sign that God's healed you. And I went on to explain. I said, a cancer has life of its own. It's growing. It's a living thing. Are you listening to me? And I said, it's a, a demon spirit that causes it. And now when I pray for God to kill the very roots of that, I said, there's something that was alive, but now it's dead. And just like any dead meat, it's going to rot. And I said, when it rots, corruption sets in in 72 hours. And I said, your body will be trying to cast that off because of all the poisons. So I said, you'll think you're going to die. You'll be sicker than you are now. But I said, it's a sign that you've been healed. And on the third day, that woman was there at home and she'd lost weight. She was skin and bones, all this. And all of a sudden, she got real sick and fainty and uh, the daughters and all of them got all carried away and called the ambulance and she started spitting up blood. And they rushed her over to Norfolk Hospital. I forgot General, I believe it was called. Norfolk General Hospital. They got her in there. They were sitting out there and trying to get a doctor to the emergency room. And they brought a white bath towel. And she was spitting up blood. By the time the doctor got there, in just a few minutes, the towel had turned blood red. And she began to gagging. Somebody said, oh, mama's dying. Mama said, no, sir. Said, a prophet told me the other day I'd get sick. But it was a sign that I had been healed. And I was going to cast all this up. She started gagging and she spit up this old flesh that was rotten. That cancer literally came out of there. And that doctor told in a little while, said he'd been a physician for, I forgot, 15, 20, 30 years. He said, I've never seen anybody spit up a cancer. But she did. And I told them government men, I said, if you doubt it, you go to Norfolk General Hospital and find out if it happened. You contact Deacon Tyson. Find out if I ever knew the woman when she come through there and God showed me what was wrong with her. 
They grabbed their hats. They was mad as wet hens. They left, and that's been 15 years. I ain't never seen them no more. But what I'm telling you, the government of our land does not believe in healing. They don't believe in all of this. They would give anything in the world to stop preachers if they could. And there will come an hour when they'll stop me, they'll stop churches like this. That's why you better get in here and sit in here on Sunday and fan if you have to and stay three or four hours if you have to to get this word of God in you because there may come an hour when you'll not have the freedom to gather here. They may put me in jail. They may kill me. They may kill you. I don't know. Somebody said, now, nah, Brother Jim, this is the United States. Go ahead. Stick your head in the sand and think it ain't going to happen. I'm telling you, you better make use of the time that we have. We won't always have this opportunity. So what we have here, you see, it might be one thing. See, in this country, they said it was founded on separation of church and state. Everybody got religious freedom and politics is something else. But here in the third verse, in Revelation chapter 13... The same man that was the head of the religion was the head of the state. And the Catholic Church, this is history, has put to death. They admitted in their own writings. I've got them laying on the shelf in my closet now. They admit that they have murdered 68 million people in the name of God and religion. What people that didn't agree with them? You think they ain't bloodthirsty? You think they won't do it again? And then I look at these silly Pentecostals and silly Charismatics and PTLs up there. Oh, they're, oh, Mother Teresa, this old woman, she's so sweet. Ain't no doubt, maybe she is. And the Pope is such a nice man. Murderers! That's all they are, and that's all that they've ever been. That spirit's on them. And this blessed Bible that I'm reading from said that the blood of every martyr was found in that church. Somebody said that's hard, but bless God, it's the truth, it's the Bible, and it is history. So they've killed before, and they're going to kill again. Just remember that. But they've suckered in the assembly of God, and the church of God, and all of these denominations, they've suckered them into that. You see what suckered them in? How many want to know what suckered them into it? Because of the doctrine that the Pentecostals started where they said that the initial evidence is speaking with tongues. The Pentecostals teach that's how you know you got the Holy Ghost is because you talk with tongues. So... You get Catholics talking in tongues and according to their own theology, the Pentecostals say, well... They got the same spirit we got. Some of the popes, I think his sister and some of them, speak with tongues and all of this. Amen. I think about David Duplis that they call the father of Pentecost. He's the one that had to lead them all toward that. He said all the most spiritual thing in the world would be me to sit up on a couch with the pope on one side and Jim Baker on the other and all of us talking in tongues and praising God. You see, their theology said that's how you know you got the Holy Ghost is because you speak with tongues. And that's not true. The Bible said, and I'm not here to preach that. I don't have notes on that today. But said, do all speak with tongues? Jesus told us what the evidence of the Holy Ghost was. He said, when the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, is come whom the world cannot receive, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And I look around today and I see all of these charismatics ain't nothing but a bunch of bobbed haired painted up women wearing a pair of pants. You think the Holy Ghost falls on that? When listen, Jesus said the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The very word itself is the life and is the spirit. And this Bible itself said for women, said it was an abomination for a woman to put on any kind of clothing that pertained to a man's clothing. How could you have the Holy Ghost 
and wear them fashions like men wear. You can't do it. See the very, it's just like this. You go out in the orchard out here somewhere. Somebody said that's a peach tree. It might look like one, but if it's got apples hanging on there, you can bet your bottom dollar it's an apple tree. So all you got to do is fruit inspect. You see some woman dressing like that, that proves that her spirit has not been changed. I heard a preacher down in Tennessee the other day talking about some young guy was on dope, had hair way down his back like some woman, hadn't took a bath and I don't know when, this, that, and the other. And somehow he found a book, one of these books, and he read a little something and he got to ask one of his friends something about it. He said, who are these people? What, what is all this? And he said, wonder if there's any churches around here. The guy said, well, there's, yeah, I said, there's one right over here, but said that they're about 160 miles down the road that I believe is better. So here come this hippie one Sunday. Come in there, hair all hanging down, stinking, ain't shaved, ain't done nothing. And that pastor just preached his usual sermon. But something got a hold of that young man. Next Sunday, he come back with a shave and a haircut and a bath. And the pastor said he's made one of the best members that I got. What was it? There was a seed laying down in his heart. He was one of them elected seeds like we preach about. The same thing that Jesus run into when he went down to the well. And here come a woman out to draw water. And he said, woman, bring me a drink. And she could tell by the way he was dressed that he was not a Samaritan, that he was a Jew. She said, we've got segregation, sir. And said, us Samaritans have no dealing with you Jews. He said, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. And any man that drinks of the water I give him to drink of shall never thirst again. He talked to her for a minute, then he said, Woman, go get your husband. She said, I don't have one. He looked at her and said, You've had five. And you living with one now and not even married to him. Honey, that rung her bell. She knew he didn't know her. <laughs> what was it? All mixed up, been married five times over here, living with a man not even married to him. But somehow down in there was an elected seed. And when that seed come in contact, oh, with the right conditions, all of a sudden the past faded away. All of a sudden she was renewed, renewed in her mind. She found out who she was. She didn't have to be a prostitute, some infield fame woman. She was an elected child of God. You gotta find out who you are. Amen. That changed her in a moment's time when she saw that. So <clears throat> she went running into the city, said, Come see a man that's told me everything I've ever done. Amen. Young man went in there with all that long hair and stuff. He heard one sermon. That's all he had to hear to change him. God got to working on him. That seed in there, the fire fell and burned off the worldly nature and it changed him. The Bible said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. I'll get into that in a moment. Let me hurry with this. What we had here in Revelation 13 and 3, we had a pope who was the head of the politics and the head of religion. And what did he do? He lost his political authority. I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death. Political Rome was destroyed. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. See, he still had his religious thing. How many understand that? It would be like if I was the mayor of the city and the pastor of this church. And they had a new election and I lost out as mayor, well, I'd still be the pastor. So here this guy was the head of politics and the head of religion. He killed 68 million people, but he had a deadly wound. The political powers was wounded. He lost that, but he still had the religious powers and the world wandered after him. So almost all the books that you read about Revelation, they'll talk about how the devil will raise this fellow from the dead. It's not so. The devil cannot raise the dead. 
The devil cannot create. The devil cannot heal. The devil cannot give life. Amen. Now, speaking of that, I have a question about uh, <clears throat> these things, about uh, death. Let me quickly go over this. We, you are looking at my physical body. I'm going to go through this one more time. Watch this now. This is my flesh. That's all you can see is my flesh. Down in here is a spirit. And inside that spirit is my soul. Now the soul is the real you. That's who you really are. Now, at death, let's watch this. When we die, the Bible said this body goes back to the dust from whence we came. The spirit goes back to God. And that leaves the soul. The three are separated. Do you understand? So we have a soul. Now, where that soul goes depends on whether you're saved or lost. If you're lost, it's going to hell. And if you're saved, it's going to heaven. It's that simple. Do you understand? Now, in death, the prophet of God said one day, he was given the example. He said when Jesus Christ was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane that God tore the spirit out of Jesus Christ. His soul left him on the cross. It was his soul that went down and preached to the spirits that were in prison. How many know the Bible said so? He went down and preached to the souls that were in prison. See, it was the souls of men that were in hell. And that's where he went down to preach. Now watch this. The Bible said if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved. In other words, if I should die, the Bible said I have another body waiting. Now, we're talking of a, uh, this gets complicated, but a theophany body. Now let's study it for just a moment. God is a spirit. And you cannot see a spirit. But there were times in the Old Testament when God came down and was seen of man. He wrestled all night with Jacob. God was in a body, Elhim, God, the all-sufficient one, was in a theophany body. Now what I'm talking about, a theophany body, it might look like flesh, but it was different. Watch one time Jesus came down in a theophany body and got in a fiery furnace and didn't even get burned up. And not only that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't get burned up either. Do you see what I'm saying? That theophany body could walk through walls, could walk on water, could walk through the fire, could walk through an atomic explosion. There's nothing could hurt that. So Jesus Christ, now let's watch this, came from spirit form to a theophany body and then was born into flesh then had a flesh body when he was born of Mary all of us came from God direct to flesh we never came through the theophany body we've never had that now that made Jesus Christ different than me and you now watch but when this earthly tabernacle is dissolved then we our soul is going into this theophany now let's take the spirit a moment the Bible said the spirit goes back to God that gave it now upon this earth we've got two classes of people what the Bible say it tells us there are some people who are serpent seed is that right we've got two families here in this earth I'm trying to put this simple so you'll understand it. We've got God's family, and we've got the devil's family. We've got the seed of God, the seed of the serpent. So, but everybody has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now the spirit came from God. So there, in, even in the serpent seed people, there is what I would call a permissive spirit of God. A spirit that God 
permitted to dwell in that body, to give them life and so forth, even though they were serpent seed. What happens to the spirit when it goes back? I don't know. Maybe God destroys it. But they had a permissive spirit. Because we all have to have spirit, soul, and flesh. And our spirit goes back to God. Now, I'm not trying to be complicated trying to explain this thing. The Bible said if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have another one waiting. So, what have we got? We have people who die. All right, let's take Sister Moore. She died. I'm not Sister Moore's judge. You're not her judge, but let's... Uh, Suppose that she made it. See, I'm not like preachers. If my own daddy dies, I don't know if he made it or not. I don't know if Sister Moore made it. I hope they both made it. We assume they did. Hello? See, I'm not going to... If Brother Ben die, I ain't going to put him in heaven. I may preach his funeral, but he's already preached his funeral. He done preached it while he was alive. Whenever your time, of course, you may outlive me. Tough old bird over there, I'll tell you. But... <laughs> But if she dies, she's done preached her funeral. Amen. Before I ever get word that she's gone, she's already going to be where she was going. And ain't nothing I can get up here and say that would change where she went to. And that's another one of the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And they talk about Brother Jim raising money, you know. That man's out for the money. Well, all I ask people to do is give offerings and pay tithes. The Bible says that. But what did the Catholic Church do? They not only teach a heaven and a hell, but they come up with one that's not even in the Bible called purgatory. And they get in there and have them masses. And if you got high money, you get a high mass. Got low money, you get a low mass. You got no money, you get no mass. That's what they say. Anyway, so they, you know, the candle goes out. And they said, oh my, he didn't make heaven and he didn't go to hell. He's in purgatory and we got to pray to get him out. But it's going to cost you some money to get him out. And they charge according to how much ever it is the family's got. I mean, they just, if you're rich, I mean, they're going to soak you. To pray this dear old soul out of a place called purgatory. Kind of reminds me of the story I heard. The priest got to praying this one old man out. And got his head prayed out. Y'all going to have to bring some more money. And we get his arms out. And bring a little more. We'll get him out up to his waist. And the family's about to go broke. And they finally got one leg out. Had him all out but one leg. They said it's going to take some more money to get the other leg out. They said he was a pretty lively old soul. We believe he can just jump the rest of the way out. Because that's all we got. But if you think that doesn't play on the emotions of people, when somebody dies, now there are a lot of good funeral directors. I think of uh, Brother Sister Richardson over there in Nashville. I don't know them real well, but I like what she told me. They let me preach in their funeral home, and I'll never forget that. She said, people come in here bereaved. And said, we tell them, now you've got to Realize that life's going to go on after this one's dead. You've got bills to pay tomorrow, so don't get carried away on buying the most expensive coffin. When my daddy died, I went to the funeral home to help pick out his coffin, and there was two or three things that my sister and I talked about that we had to do. One of the ones was uh, we couldn't cry. I felt like it. Any tears I shed, I shed in private. But my mama was a real soft-hearted person, and we know she was going to cry. And if I cried, I knew she was going to cry. And we decided we got to, people will probably talk about us. <laughs> Look at that. Their own daddy died, and they ain't even shed a tear. But I figured mama might well have a heart attack the way she carried on when my uncle died. And people die, she didn't hardly know, and she just goes squalling and carrying on, you know. And I always dreaded that day. So we, that was one thing. We decided we would try not to cry. And when Mama was carrying on the worst, I just had to go to the bathroom. I said, y'all just excuse me. And, uh, but anyway, that was one thing. But the second thing was we decided that uh, 
we would let her know not to buy the most expensive coffin, maybe something nice, but so we bought about the most economical thing there, and it was still $3,100. Now, that's kind of a rip-off because I bought them coffins to have them resurrection services in. I can go right down here to Pine Tops and buy, oh, that was 10 years ago, I could buy a pretty nice coffin for $25. Hello? For $150, I could have bought a metal one. So you think these funeral directors ain't getting rich? Hello? And then they'll tell you, you know, they got all these fees for embalming. I don't know about this state, but in West Virginia, the man said, you don't have to embalm your dad. But said, if you don't, said, we have to have a closed coffin for the funeral. They don't tell that some places. Of course, the law now is making them. But what I'm saying, there's a big <coughs> price to pay for all of that. So we're talking about death. But uh, I tried not to cry. Didn't want to get my mama started. I knew it was going to be bad as it was. She did better than I thought, though. But anyhow, before I ever got the word that my daddy had died, he had already got where he was going. He preached his funeral when he was alive. So let's just take Sister Moore, all right? Let's put her over into heaven. And I never put people one place or the other. But we're going to put her over there for a minute. Unless I've seen a vision. You know, if God showed me somebody's over there, then that settles it. But let's just say she's over there and we trust that she is. She sure followed long enough. She heard enough teaching. I believe Brother Silver's over. I believe some of these others over there. We have Sister Perry, different ones. I believe they made it. But anyhow, let's, let's, let, we're going to take Sister Moore, all right? One day laying in that hospital in Greenville, and I don't know how soon it was, but they say that the first thing that goes is the spirit. The soul goes a little bit later. Now, the, and I don't know how they know this, but they always say that in death, that the hearing is the last thing to go. Now, you tell me how they know that. I don't know, but I've, and you always heard that? They, they can hear. <clears throat> That's the last one of the senses to leave. And I feel the reason being is because that soul is the real you. All right? And it's there that you hear the Word of God and you understand it down in your soul. And as long as that soul is there, you'll probably hear it. Amen. When the soul's gone, then that's it. Now when she... So one day there, maybe five minutes before, could have been the day before. I don't know when. But her spirit left out. Now, she wasn't dead yet because that soul is the real you. But I believe that she would have known something was going to happen. I believe she knew that when I took her by the hand on Sunday afternoon before she died. And I said, you got to get out of this place, honey. And I was cutting up with her a little bit. I said, you got some more envelopes to lick and stuff for me. And when I said that, though, tears started rolling down her cheeks, and I knew then that she knew that she wasn't coming out of there. I believe she already was aware that she was crossing over. No, she wasn't talking. Ain't no telling what she might have seen. When people get down to death's door, they tell me that they see things in the other world. The other world becomes real. All right. When the time came that that soul left that body, now the spirit's already gone, and the soul is a real you, when that soul left this body, it had another body that it went into. When this earthly tabernacle is dissolved, we have another one waiting. So she's gone into another body. Now, at that point, they go somewhere under the altar of God. We'll look at that for just a moment. Revelation 6 and 9, And when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, that was under the fifth seal. That was Jews. But that's where the dead people go is somewhere under the altar of God is the way the Bible describes it. 
It's a place like a beautiful park or paradise or something. They do not eat or anything like that over there. And while, and they're not really that happy over there. Now they're happy. They know they've made it. But they're not complete yet. You see, if I've got a soul and a spirit and a body, and one of them's gone, I'm not a complete person. Now I get to thinking about Brother Branham. Way back in the uh, latter part of the 50s, he had a strange experience one day. He talked about how one morning, four or five o'clock in the morning maybe, he said he was laying on the bed and kind of propped up on the pillow, had his arms back, and said he had a, got to talking to himself, just in his mind like, I guess, saying, oh boy, you're 50 some years old, said if you was ever going to do anything for God, said you better get started. Well, in just a little bit, he left the body. Now, if this was a vision, it was a strange vision. But said he got as far as the ceiling or something and looked back and saw himself laying there and thought maybe he died. But in a moment, there was like an angel that was guiding him and just eight or ten feet away, he said, was this place called like a paradise or something. And he said there was millions of people dressed in white robes. I'm not sure. I believe he said they were barefooted. I'm not sure about that. But anyway... He said, they came and hugged his neck and said, our precious brother. And they were all about 20 some years old. Said, the angel asked him, said, this one young lady come and hugged him and said, don't you recognize her? And he said, no. Angel said she was about 80 or 90 years old when you led her to Christ. And now he said it was such a tremendous place. He did not want to come back to the flesh. Are you listening to me? When it was told that he had to come back, he had more preaching to do, and he didn't want to leave that place. Now, because he had to come back to a body of flesh, he said that was a place he considered sublime. He said it was far beyond anything we've ever known here. He talked about perfect love. He said nobody can ever enter into that place without perfect love. And, but he had to come back. But the people there told him, said, we don't eat, and I think they didn't drink or anything like that there. What they were doing, they were waiting for the resurrection. Now watch, this body that went down is going to be resurrected. Now let's just see if we can find something. I don't mean to take all the time on this today, but... Uh, Let's just look over in 1 Corinthians and see what it has to say. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which soweth is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. One is heavenly, see, and a celestial body is a heavenly body, the terrestrial body is an earthly body. There's one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now let's just stop there for a moment. What happens when we die? This body corrupts. 
It rots. That's what it's talking about. This body, Job said, Though my skin worms destroy my flesh, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now Job called them my skin worms. I've got worms in me and you've got worms in you. And when my spirit and my soul is gone, the worms that's already in here is going to eat me up. But Job said, though my skin worms destroy my flesh, yet in my flesh shall I see God. How could this be? We're getting to it. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such as they also that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. But he said, I'm going to show you some true doctrine. I'm going to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, we'll not all have to die. There'll be some standing alive on this earth that will be just changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this incorruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now, I'm going to stop right there. Do you see what I'm saying? The worms will destroy this flesh. But let's watch. Let's take this pulpit stand. What is this? Well, it's wood. Where did it come from? It's a tree. One day they cut the tree down and sawed out all this, made this thing. Now, let's suppose that uh, one of these days, let's say this building caught on fire and burned to the ground. And this pulpit stand was destroyed. Is it really? There's some ashes, isn't it? Hello? So the chemical elements and so forth that made up this pulpit stand is still here. It's just kind of changed from one form to another. It's no longer just a tree. It's been cut out. It looks like this. Time stands. It'll be destroyed. Throw it out here and rot. So if it rots, still yet... Whatever made it up is still here, those molecules and all. The same with these bodies. Might go back to dust, but somewhere, every little part, every chemical that made up this body is still in this earth. So, we got these folks over in this place waiting. <clears throat> They're waiting. What are they waiting on? They're waiting on you. Waiting on me. They, without us, hello, we got to get this church right. Some of them liable to be in here today saying, come on, Brother Jim, hurry up and preach. Get this bunch straight, the ones that's going. If you ain't going, don't matter no how. Hello? <laughs> but there's somebody sitting here that's going to make it. And I imagine those over there saying, we can't come back and pick up our body and be a whole complete person again until you get the living church right. Now I believe they're here. Brother Brandon, when he had that vision, said they wasn't but eight or ten feet away. I think he preached that in the sermon, The Rejected King, I believe is the name of it, if you find the book or tape. 
He tells about the vision. They published it in a lot of magazines and things. So what are you saying? They are in a place. Their soul there. They've gone into this other body. But there has to come a time when there is a resurrection. Whatever elements made up that body, it will have to resurrect. It will have to get together again. And they will enter into a glorified body. So you see the difference between the dead Christians and the living ones is this. Watch this. The dead people are there waiting. Now when the resurrection happens, that chemical elements that made up their body will bring forth that body. God will call them from the dust of the earth. What, where did he get Adam? He formed man out of the dust of the earth. Is that right? Now what did man do? Man introduced something. You see, God's plan was to call children out of the dust of the earth. God could just speak and it could happen. But here was Adam and Eve. They were told to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. But what did Eve do? She went over and introduced sex. And so before God could come down to destroy her, which no doubt He would have done, but Adam took her and knew her, and it saved her. I hope you're catching this. Somebody said, I don't believe there's no sex. I believe they ate an apple. You've come too late to tell me that mess. You've been listening to some old dead Baptist preacher somewhere. Hello? Wasn't no apple at all. It was sex. So Adam goes over and he knows his wife. She bore a son by him named Cain, or, or Abel. And the serpent knew her and beguiled her, the Bible said, and she bore his child, and he was Cain. And Cain killed his brother. And the Bible said that Satan was a murderer and a liar and the father of it. Now when did the devil ever become a daddy? If it wasn't when he entered into the serpent and beguiled Eve. So then the plan was changed a little bit instead of calling them out of the dust. The world was populated by sexual desire. But there will come a time again when it will go back to the original plan when God will call His children by His spoken word out of the dust of the earth. It will be God speaking and they will come forth. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16 The Lord will ascend with a shout with the voice of the archangel. It's that voice of the archangel that raises the dead. He will call His children out of the dust. He's the creator. Can he do it? The devil can't create. Remember that. So he'll call his children. So the only difference between dead and alive, see the dead folks over there, they're just as conscious as you are and everything. They're just waiting on us. And they're waiting for the time when they can come back and that body is raised up as a glorified body. Then they'll be a complete person. Then they will eat and so forth just like we do. The only thing happens to us, the ones that are alive and remain, we'll just be changed. In other words, without ever having to leave this body and it being destroyed and raised back up and all this, this body will just become glorified while we're living in it. And the moment in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. This mortal body that has to die all of a sudden will just become immortal, can't die, become glorified. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's why in this church I preach so hard. You see, it's a responsibility. It's not a game. It's a very sincere thing. The rapture of the church cannot take place until the last soul gets in. Remember that one thing. Watch this. It's just like this. God, in His mind... In his thinking, had some children. We are predestinated. We're chosen of God. Ephesians said we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. So watch what has to happen. Every soul that God had in mind has got to come to this new birth. 
That don't mean just sitting here hearing Brother Jim preach. That don't mean just paying your tithes. It means you have to be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the new birth. You have to have, like we preached the other day, the token applied. Now watch this. Over there in the day of Moses, they killed the lamb and, and uh, they, they put the blood on the doorpost. And the angel said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. So it was blood that he saw. Now watch this. We preach this, and I don't mean to be complicated, and it's getting hot on me here. I'm about to hot to death, so I got to quit in a minute. But in seven church ages, every age was given the down payment. They were placed under the chemistry of the blood. Do you see what I mean? It was... All right, here was a lamb. Watch this. And it's alive. And they slay the lamb. And they take the blood. And they put the blood on the doorpost. So the angel said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. So now, throughout seven church ages, we're talking the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Let me... Find the book of Ephesians here for just a minute. I think it's right over here somewhere before Corinthians. I thought it was. It ain't. Wait a minute. It's after Corinthians. So watch what we have. In Ephesians... 1 and 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So the Bible said the Holy Spirit was given as a down payment, the earnest of our inheritance. Everybody in all of the time since the day of Pentecost has been laid away under a down payment. They've died. They're over there waiting on you and I. They were under a chemistry of the blood. Listen to me now. But it's got to the point now where it's not just the blood, not just the chemistry of the blood, but we have to have the very life of the lamb that was slain itself. Not just the chemistry of the blood, but it has become Christ in you. The hope of glory. I, I wish I could bring this out fully, that you could understand me. Somebody said, I've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's fine. That's a temporary gift. It was an earnest of the inheritance or a down payment. You got to have more than that today. Somebody said the blood's applied, not if you're not walking in the light. But today, it's the very life of the token itself that has to be applied. It's got to be Him in you. I hope you understand how it goes deeper. See the Pentecostal people running around, I'm talking in tongues, I got the Holy Ghost. Man, you got to have more than that. That might have been all right in the seven church ages, but the seven church ages have ended. And we're now living in a period of time there, Revelation 4 and 5, wherein the day of redemption is going on. What is happening, Brother Jim? Well, the very life of the token has got to be applied. Not just the chemistry of the blood, but the life itself. So what are you saying? The Word of God's got to be preached and that fire of God come in there and burn out all that malice, envy, hatred, prejudice, strife, whatever's in there, backbiting, gossiping. Hello? All that's got to be burned out. The old man's got to die. See, the only way you're going to make it is if God put a seed in you. You can go out there and plow that field all you want to, but if you don't sow no seeds, there'll never be a life, there'll never be a harvest, there'll never be a crop of corn. 
And honey, the point of it is, the only way that you're going to ever have eternal life is if God predestinated you. That's what it all, He chose you. And when He chose you, He put a seed down in there. And so one of the, one day, when this gospel is preached and the fire falls, it destroys that old soul. But there laid that seed. Just like a man <clears throat> in him is every child that he'll ever have. In his loins. Laying there. But one day when that seed is planted and so forth, it'll bring forth. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So it's the same way. Here was a seed laying down in there. A seed of God. We are one of the germs of God or sperm of God. Whatever you want to call it. And... Jesus Christ, that quickening spirit, He quickens that seed. You can put a fruit jar full of corn and it'll never grow. Why? It's got to be quickened. It's got to be buried. And the proper things have to happen to that corn before it can ever grow. You may have been a seed laying in there, a predestinated seed of God, but nothing happened. You were out in sin and just living and hurrahing and carrying on. But Bless God, one day that seed had to become quickened. It's through the preaching of the gospel. The preaching, you finally heard the message of the hour. And it did for you like that hippie I was preaching about a while ago. You hear it one time, it'll change you. It'll make you women grow long hair. Oh, I preach it and nobody don't listen. Mm -hmm. We stubborn in this church. Some of you just going on and doing your thing. Let me preach on a little while. I listened to the prophet of God preach something over here the other day. It ought to make everybody in here that's a woman grow your hair long. He got to preaching. I don't even know if I can find it now. But he got to preaching about some plagues that was coming up on the earth. I'm not sure where it was at now. But anyhow, one of the plagues. The Bible spoke about something like locusts. Coming out of the bottomless pit. And said they had long hair like women. How many is listening to me? And I heard that prophet of God saying they were going to come. They'd be spiritual demons out of the pit of hell like locusts. And they're going to torment women that have cut their hair. He said it'll be hallucinations. They'll think they're really seeing something. You think we don't have hallucinations going on today? I heard one of my preacher friends the other day talk about somebody that saw something like a big bird with 14 foot wingspans and the boy about went crazy. He didn't see no such thing. He just thought he saw it. I heard some of them talking about the lizard man down in South Carolina. Maybe that's what they were seeing. Some of these strange tales. But listen to me. People has gone crazy in this world. They're going nuts. There's a spiritual insanity. The Bible said in the last days they'd be naked and don't even know it. He said, you're wretched, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked and knoweth it not. I went in a Radio Shack store over in Raleigh the other day. And the guy said, I'll be glad when this hot weather is over. I said, why is that? He said, because it's brought out all the nuts and the fruitcakes and the crazy people. Hot weather's affected them. People are crazy. If you don't believe it, just come down to my office and sit there one day. Listen in when some of the nuts call me up. Amen. I mean, there's some folks need to be in a home somewhere. The world's full of basket cases. Don't hang up on me. Somebody said, now I take that as an insult because you preach to black folks. I ain't even talking about black folks now. I might preach a lot to black people. But honey, I found out there's some white folks that's just as crazy as Bessie Bugs. Crazy. Color ain't got nothing to do with it. I mean, I've met two or three total idiots this week. Just nuts. Insanity's got to be on the rise. Didn't have nothing to do with color. All of them was white. 
But the prophet of God said they'll be having hallucinations like thinking they're seeing things that they're not even seeing. It'll be locusts. It'll be spirits out of the pit of hell that's going to torment women who cut their hair. Now go ahead and cut yours some more if you want to. But when it happens, when you have one of them terrible hallucinations, when you think you've been stung by that thing and all of this, don't come, oh, my Jim, you're going to pray. I, had to move. I ain't going to pray for you then. Hello? The Bible said for the woman to have long hair for the angel's sake. Somebody said, what does that mean? What is an angel? A messenger. A woman ought to have long hair because any messenger of God is going to condemn these bob-headed women. Quiet in here now. So I'm going to preach it now. And if you don't want to live that, that's up to you. But when you get to having all of these terrible demonic things coming at you and all of this, I'm telling you, don't come to me. I ain't going to pray for you then. I'm going to tell you, you made your bed. Now you're going to have to lay in it. I'm off the subject, but somebody said, well, I can't grow long hair. Then I ain't talking to you. I don't care how long or short it is, just don't cut it. But we're living, what's this now, in this hour, where it's not good enough just to shake hands with the preacher. It's not good enough just to join the church. It's not good enough to just get out, Lord, apply the blood to my heart. It's not the chemistry of the blood anymore. But what's got to happen? The preaching's got to come and destroy the old soul, destroy all of the nature around it, and quicken, the Holy Spirit will quicken that seed of God that's laying in there. Everybody has a place for a soul, but some folks don't have one, not of God. I mean, they have a soul, but not from God. Are you listening? Only the predestinated. The ones that was chosen of God. That's what makes me want to shout, see. I don't know what it was God saw in me, but somehow God chose me. And so it's not me anymore. The old man, the old Jim Loudermilk is dead. The old soul is gone. But that... Seed of God, the Bible said he cannot sin because his seed remaineth in him. It's the seed of God that's in you that becomes your soul. I won't have time to look up them scriptures. I've preached them 10,000 times. Go look up your notes. Or... But the seed of God becomes our soul. So it's no longer just a, a little blood applied. It's It's... No longer just a down payment of the Holy Spirit, but it's the actual life of God Himself. We are a spiritual gene of God, one of the seed of God. No wonder I can't sin, because God can't sin. God can't stand to look upon sin, and my soul has now become a little miniature God. I, uh, one, just one little germ, but it's of God. Whatever sin I did, what is sin? See, we got it all balled up. What sin? Sin is unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. Sin is unbelief. There was a time you didn't know the Word of God. Some of you didn't believe the Word of God. And that was sin. Somebody said, I thought drinking, gambling, and playing dominoes and old maids was sin. <laughs> Whatever. We can make up all kinds of things of sin. I heard somebody preaching the other day, it's a sin to read the comic paper. It's a sin to do this. We've made up a lot of things that we call sin, but there ain't but one sin. And that's unbelief. Now that don't mean you go and commit adultery or go get drunk or do this or that or the other. Hello? Those are attributes of unbelief. But when you ever really believe, bless God, that experience will come upon you where that fire of God burns out the old man. Seed of God gets quickened. A little part of God is in you. And you can't sin. Whatever I did, and I've done a lot of things wrong. I've been a terrible person. Look at me strange, you have too. We've all been bad. 
But that wasn't me. I regret those things. But that's the old man. He liable to have done anything. If it wasn't for the mercies of God, I'd have probably killed somebody. Or I never did do that. Amen. Never did rob a bank. Never did shoot nobody or cut nobody. Or I mean, I still was pretty bad. All that's beside the point. That's all in the old man. Whatever I did, if I stole something, it's the old man. If I lied, that was the old man. Somebody look at me and say, I remember you did that. I probably did. I did all that and a whole lot you don't know about. And you did all that and a whole lot I don't know about. But I'm telling you, that was the old man. I have realized my soul has been changed. Hallelujah. I got a new soul. I'm a new person. The Bible said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It didn't say one that was washed, one shined up, cleaned up, said he is a new creature. I have a new soul. That's the real me is the soul. And it's not just me anymore, but it's God. It's Christ in you. One writer said it was Christ being formed in you. That's what's happening to me. And it's never happened in any other generation till now. That's what I'm saying. Something going on today that's never happened before. In all these other generations for 2,000 years, they've come down and tried to get saved and tried to get blood on over their sins and this and that and the other. But never until now has Christ been formed in His people. Hallelujah. I hope you're understanding. It just all fit together. So I'm new. Now the point I'm trying to say in this church. It's not enough to just sit here and hear me preach. Or give a little money. Or get a perfect attendance pen or something. No, there's more to it than that. This new birth has got to happen to you. Christ has got to be formed in you. You've got to have this experience. Somebody said, how do I get it, preacher? we got to repent. And that don't mean to get down to the altar and holler, Oh, God, I'm sorry that I stole that money out of Aunt Lucy's pocketbook. Lord, I'm sorry that I stole them brick bets or banana bets or whatever from the store over there. God, I'm sorry that I've done this. It just ain't that. Sure, we're sorry for all of that. God, forgive me of all my sin, all my unbelief, but... To repent means to turn and walk a different way. To have a change of mind. A change of heart. Don't do the things you used to do. And you don't do them because you don't want to do them anymore. Somebody said, I still want to. Then you ain't had the new birth yet. You've never repented. When you really get what I'm talking about, you don't want to do them things. Some of you used to dance a jig, you know, and, and your heart's, Lord, I wish I could just go down there on Saturday night and boog a little while, but I'm a Christian, I can't. You might as well go ahead, you want to. You just ride in the top of the fence. You better do some praying until God takes the want to out. I'm telling you, God's changed me in a lot of ways, just recently. More and more, I got to the point where I'm getting to be such an oddball. You ever get to the point where you just can't stand to be around people hardly? People are in such sin. I, I was listening. I got a tape from some preacher. I don't even know him. And I was listening to his sermon. And I heard him make a statement about going down to the mall. He said, if you ever hear me going to the shopping center, said I, you know that I had to get something and I went there to get it, but I ain't going to stay to watch the strip tease show. And it didn't dawn on me for a second what he was talking about. I thought, what, what kind of mall is he? wonder what city he's from. They got a strip tease place in the mall? And then it dawned on me. That he was talking about all these women wearing their little shorts and things. He said, I'm not going to sit there and watch the show. That's what he was talking about. 
It's got to the point in my life I just can't stand to see some of the, my righteous indignations raising up anymore. Seeing some of these hairy-legged old men coming in there and their shirts off in some restaurant and people barefooted coming in to eat. I said they don't even know how to dress to go out in public anymore. And I said if it bothers me, it must be a stench in the nostrils of God. Yeah, I'm getting to be more of an oddball. God changing me more and more as time goes on. I hope I'm getting more Christ-like. Hallelujah. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. Somebody raise your hands and tell him how much you love him in here today. Hallelujah. So I'm just glad there's been a change down in here. I'm a new person. I'm a new creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. My friend, something's getting ready to happen in this old world. It won't be long now. It can't be long now. We're here living in a time wherein redemption is being claimed. One day soon, that voice of the archangel is going to sound. And those that are in their graves are going to come forth. That body's coming out of there. And the living is going to be changed. Do you think this world will ever know it? They don't know what's going on. I've been studying the book of Hebrews. Let me close with this. We've been in the book of Hebrews, and I'm trying to finish Hebrews so we can get on to some other things that would be fine for this television show that we're going to do, where we're going to preach this message. But last night, in the middle of the night, I'd just been troubled, and I couldn't sleep. And I picked up my Bible, and it fell open to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. I'll try to finish this next week. Hebrews 12 and 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. <laughs> For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away him that speaketh from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised saying yet once more I shake not the earth only but also heaven. Something just laid it on my heart. Said that verse is talking about that great earthquake that's coming to California. God shook this earth back in 1964. On Good Friday there was an earthquake in Alaska that shook the earth but it didn't knock it out of orbit but he's going to shake it one of these days the heavens and the earth hallelujah and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Something's getting ready to happen. I don't know when. God's getting ready to shake this old earth. I get to thinking like this. You see, things are going on that we don't understand in this thing. The seven church ages are over. I believe they ended up at least by 1977. There was things prophesied to happen in 77. Somebody said some of them didn't happen, but it's in the earth. Hello? Things are going on that the world don't understand. I believe those church ages have ended. We're in a new day. We're in a day of redemption. The church ages are over. 
God's getting ready to shake not only the earth, but heaven also. There's going to be a tragedy hit this world soon, the likes of which have never been known. I feel it, don't you? Don't you feel the cup of iniquity is full? God's getting ready to say, that's all. What are we waiting on? It cannot happen until this. Till that last predestinated seed of God is quickened. It cannot happen. Just remember that. Everyone that God knew in the beginning, those he foreknew, every one of them will be there. He said he had lost none. Hello? If God has a soul in darkest Africa, or in the Amazon, or in Los Angeles, or in Eskimo country, it matters not where, but if there's one seed that has not been quickened, they'll have to hear the gospel. They'll have to be changed before it can happen. And I've come to the place where I believe the cup of iniquity is full. How much further can we go? When the other day, Sister Anise was somewhere and they had a TV on or something and she was watching one of these shows to show you how perverted, how much further could people go? They, they had some, I, don't, I forgot what they was arguing about now, but anyway, it was over homosexuality or something. And some woman jumped up in the audience and said, I'm a lesbian, and said, all you straight people's going to hell. Y'all the ones that's wrong, and y'all are all going to hell. Said, we're the only ones that's the children of God. How warped could that demon-possessed, demented woman be? How much further could we go? Hello? When they're putting all their filth on television, it's not... Not safe to even watch it. Hello? Need to just get you a little recorder and get some tapes of preaching and stuff and forget about, I'll take your antenna down, forget about all that trash you got. It ain't fit to watch. Ought not to be watching. We're letting our kids watch stuff like that. Some of you mamas will just let them watch it to keep them out of your hair. Shame on you. The Bible said, train up a child in the way it should go. They need to be watching the right things. Got quiet in here now, but I'm going to preach on anyhow. Hey Amen. We let kids watch them old televisions and listen to that old boogie-woogie music on the radio and buy them records, give them money, shame on you. You'll be guilty of their blood one of these days. Hey Amen. That's not being a mother. That's not being a daddy. Somebody said, that being hard, be hard, if that's what it takes. But how much further can this world go when Hollywood is glorifying AIDS? They just had a program on television this week. I've read about it. I didn't see it. Some man was marrying some woman that's dying with AIDS, and they're making a big glorious wedding out of it. I've read about it this week. Hollywood's glorifying it. So how much further can things go? The cup of iniquity has got to be full. And as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that's holding back the rapture right now is the fact that everybody ain't ready. And when that last one gets in, it's going to be over. And my friend, and I'm closing with this, that's why I've got a vision to do something. That's why I'll be going down into Haiti right away. That's why I'm going October 17th to Ghana. Maybe I can reach one soul down there that ain't hurt it. And what if while I'm on my tour, everybody's saved that God ever foreknew that he predestinated all of them saved but one, and that one comes to my meeting. Think about it. And what if while I was preaching, that last one believed the gospel and repented, and the Holy Ghost came and burned out that old man and quickened that seed of God in there. The rapture would be on, that's what. The earth would be shaking and quaking. It would be over then. And just remember one of these days, that last one is coming in. Every night when I preach, they tell me, when I'm on radio, they tell me there's five million people listening all over the Caribbean and South America and West Africa. 
They're hearing me preach. One of them liable to be that last seed. They may hear it on the radio. I don't know how it'll come, but I've had it on my heart a long time. Somebody said, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to tell you, wouldn't it be a shame if I got out here in one souls and other countries and other places and somebody that sat here and heard me every Sunday died and went to hell that had never been changed. Kind of take a little inventory today. Check up just a little bit and see if you really got it. Have you ever had a change of your soul? Has that seed in there ever been quickened? Has it become real to you if you repented? Have you been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Everybody bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this opportunity of gathering into the house of the Lord. Lord, I don't know, you've been so patient with me and in all of my folly and all of my failures and all of my wrongs. And I always considered myself a good person. But I think lately maybe I looked at myself like I used to be, like I really was. I guess we all have a tendency to minimize our own sins and problems and You just let me know it's grace. Somehow you've spared my life. I think of that time when I pulled right in front of that tractor and trailer. Didn't even seem how I made it across there. The angels of God had to be with me. In Parkersburg, West Virginia, Lord, my life was within one second of ending. Never saw it till it was over realizing my life could have been over that quick. I think of that night, Lord, over in Ohio when I went to sleep driving. And when I woke up, Lord, it was daylight. I don't understand it. Been driving slowly, but been driving for two or three hours. And instead of 4.15, it was now 7 in the morning and I was on the wrong side of the road. And a tank truck headed straight for me. But you woke me up. So many times, Lord, I, when I was just six, seven years old, whatever it was, six or seven, I, that thing come on me that time and I didn't eat for seven or eight days and nights. And I could have died then, but you were with me. Somehow I must have been in the plan somewhere, and I'm claiming that I was. So you've been good to me, Lord. You've been long-suffering. When I turned my back on you and went out into sin at the age of 14 because a preacher hurt my feelings, you were good to me in all of my sin and all of my folly. But Lord, help me to never stray. Help me to never fail. Help me to know this is the last hour. Help all of these to check up on their life. And those that hear this on tape, God, let them know that Getting ready to happen. That last one's coming in. We're working all of the ministers in this message around the world, taking it to India and all these other countries, South America, everywhere. That last seed's going to be reached someday and it'll be over. It'll be too late then for anybody else. So if there's one in here today that's never had the token applied, the life of that... Christ, oh God, let it happen. Grant it. Sweep over this audience in a very special way with thy spirit this day. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Somebody raise your hands and just say, Lord, apply that token to my heart. May the life of Jesus Christ come upon me. May all sin, everything be burned out. May that seed in there be quickened. Amen. God, I believe it right now. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody raise up our hands and pray.
praise God for what he's doing. God must love you to even have let you come here to hear this last day's message like this. Hallelujah. Well, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's the only one that cares and understands. Well, standing somewhere in the shadows you will find him and you'll know him by the nail prints 